Hello, this lecture is going to cover the 1920s in American history. Um, it's, we call it the Roaring Twenties. Um, it's right before the worst decade in American history economically um, called the Great Depression. Um, nonetheless, this decade is extremely important culturally in American history and American studies. Um, and we're going to kind of dive into that a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen um, and we're going to jump into it. All right, so this lecture does cover the Roaring Twenties, life and culture in America um, in the 1920s. Um, so these are the presidents of the 1920s. Um, this is Warren G. Harding, um, who's elected right after Woodrow Wilson. So at the end of World War I, Harding brings this message of returning to normalcy is what he called it. Um, he wins and his vice president is Calvin Coolidge. Harding dies about two years into his first term and Coolidge, who's his VP, um, becomes president. Fun little fact, his father actually swore him in um, in their house in, in, in Coolidge's boyhood home. So he was visiting his parents. Harding dies unexpectedly in California, I think. Um, and Coolidge is sworn in by his dad, who was a magistrate in their local community. That's just a fun fact. Imagine being a father getting to swear in your, your son to be president. Um, yeah, so Coolidge serves from 1923 until 1929, and his successor is his Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover. Um, I include Hoover for a couple of reasons. First of all, he is a president, obviously, the 1920s, um, just the last half of 1929. Um, and then the Great Depression hits. We will cover more about Hoover um, in that unit, but just to give you a little bit of a brief overview, um, Hoover's pretty complicated in history, um, and it's something we're going to talk about. I had this history teacher one time call Hoover the uh, the vacuum cleaner just because he sucks that bad as a as a president. Um, I feel like we can kind of disagree on that a little bit. Hoover's really thrown into a very complicated situation, um, but nonetheless, he is considered a president of the Roaring Twenties, um, even if it is at the very end. So, anyway, these are our three guys um, for the 1920s. So there's changing ways of life. Uh, during the 1920s, urbanization um, continued to accelerate. Um, this is the building of cities and of, 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 of uh, planning and urbanizing. Um, and for the first time, more Americans lived in cities than in rural areas and communities. Uh, New York City was home to over 5 million people in 1920, and Chicago had nearly 3 million. Um, so urban versus rural. Uh, Throughout the 1920s, Americans found themselves caught between urban and rural cultures. Urban life was considered a world of anonymous crowds, strangers, money makers, and pleasure seekers. Where rural life was considered to be safe with close personal ties, hard work, and morals. Um, today, that is still the case. Um, I believe that, in, that urban life is considered exactly what this says, um, and rural life is, is still considered to be that safe little local community, um, probably with you know, a couple of churches, a local school district, um, stuff like that. So prohibition is still happening. We talked a little bit about prohibition when we talked about the progressive era. Um, but the one example of the clash between the city and the farm was the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1920. This amendment launched the era known as prohibition. It's a new law, made it illegal to make, sell, or transport liquor. Um, prohibition lasted from 1920 to 1933, when it was repealed by the 21st Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So reformers had long believed alcohol led to crime, child and wife abuse, and accidents. Supporters were largely from the rural South and West. The church-affiliated Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union helped push for the 18th Amendment um, to the Constitution. Help to keep him pure. Please vote against the sale of liquors. Um, so this is a poster that supports prohibition in the 1920s. Um, so then we have this development of speakeasies and bootleggers. Um, American, many Americans did not believe drinking was a sin. Most immigrants, most immigrant groups were not willing to give up their drinking because that is their traditional customs. Think Germans. Um, to obtain liquor illegally, drinkers went underground to hidden saloons known as speakeasies. People also bought liquor from bootleggers who smuggled it in from Canada, Cuba, and the West Indies. 
This is also pretty cool um, because this is when you get into the, the, the hillbillies uh, of Kentucky and West Virginia who um, the story is that along the hills you would see all these little lights come up. That's because they were making moonshine um, and they were bootleggers. So organized crime takes hold because we have urbanized cities. So prohibition contributed to the growth of organized crime in every major city in the United States. Chicago became notorious as the home of Al Capone, who is a famous bootlegger um, and owner of speakeasies. So Cap Capone took control of Chicago liquor businesses by killing off his competition. He, he literally killed them. Um, he was convicted of tax evasion charges in 1931. That's ironic. So he commits murder, but he's actually convicted of tax evasion. Um, so the government fails to control liquor. So eventually prohibition's fate was sealed by the government, which failed to budget enough money to actually enforce the law that had passed. The task of enforcing prohibition fell to 1,500 1, poorly paid federal agents, clearly an impossible task to control. Um, yeah, this is literally a cartoon of, of federal agents literally pouring wine into the sewer. Uh, pretty fascinating. So the support fades for the for prohibition um, and it gets repealed. By the 1920s, only 19% of Americans actually support prohibition. Many felt prohibition caused more problems than it actually solved. So the 21st Amendment finally repealed it in 1933 at the height of the Great Depression. And a lot of that is used to because of the ec the economic benefit of selling liquor again and having it taxed legally. So science and religion begin to clash during this age as well. So another battleground was in, during the 1920s was between fundamentalists, religious groups, and secular thinkers over the truth of science. The Protestant movement grounded in the literal interpretation of the Bible is known as fundamentalism. Fundamentalists found all truth in the Bible, including science and evolution. Um, this is where we get into the denying of Charles Darwinism, and this even reaches all the way into today's American society. Whether or not you're more of a fundalist or you're more of a Charles Darwinist, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you can't deny that this clash actually occurs in the 1920s. So regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, um, this happens. Um, this fight for fundamentalism and a direct interpretation of what the Protestant Reformation gave us um, in England in the 14 and 1500s, um, sorry, in the mid 1500s, uh, clashes with this idea of what social Darwin called natural evolution or survival of the fittest. So, so this is a poster that denies evolution, creationism, scientism, and the nature of science. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty crazy time. So then we have the Scopes trial. So in March of 1925, Tennessee passed the nation's first law that made it a crime to actually teach evolution in the classroom. The ACLU promised to defend any teacher willing to challenge the law, which John Scopes did. Scopes was a biology teacher who dared to teach his students that man derived from lower species like apes or um, chimpanzees. So this is the Scopes trial. The ACLU hired Clarence Darrow the most famous trial lawyer of the era to defend Scopes. The prosecution countered with William Jennings Bryan, the three-time Democratic presidential nominee in law and loser for the presidency. So this trial opened on July 10th of 1925 and became a national sensation. In an unusual move, Darrow called Bryan to the stand as an expert on the Bible. The key, the key question that he asks is should the Bible be interpreted literally? So this is this is kind of cool. So what happens is the Bible is put on trial. So Brian wants to put, William Jennings Bryan wants to put the, um, wants to put social Darwinism on trial, but Darrow actually flips it and decides to put the Bible on trial. And this is pretty interesting. So he asks the question, should the Bible be interpreted literally? Under intense questioning, Darrow got Brian to admit that the Bible can be interpreted in different ways. Um, this is crazy. So nonetheless, Scopes was found guilty and was fined $100. So Scope lost, but the point was, was that it got the fundamentalists to admit that the Bible is interpreted in different ways. Um, regardless, again, how you fall on this issue, this is an extremely important trial in American history. Um, here is a, uh, this is a cartoon put out by fundamentalists 
where Darrow, who's the lawyer, is embracing his younger roots, the chimp. Um, so despite the guilty ver verdict, Darrow got verdict, sorry. Darrow got the upper hand during his questioning of Brian. So section two, the 20s woman. After the tumult of World War I, Americans were looking for a little fun in the 1920s. Um, the 1910s were, were boggled down in conflict and rationing and all of these other things. So they want to get a little crazy in the 1920s. Um, get a little jig going on. Um, so women were becoming more independent and achieving greater freedoms. They got the right to vote, more employment freedom of the, of the auto. Um, and during the 1920s, a new ideal woman emerged for some women called the Flapper. The Flapper was an emancipated young woman who embraced the new fashions and the urban attitudes of the age. Um, so new roles for women. So these are some 19th, early, 19th, early 20th century teachers. Um, the fast changing world of the 1920s produced new roles for women. Many, many women entered the workplace as nurses, teachers, librarians, and secretaries. However, women earned less than men and were kept out of many traditional male jobs or management and faced discrimination with employment. So this, this though emerges the changing of the family unit from the traditional time where the men worked and the women stayed home. This begins to change this, which is fantastic. So American birth rates declined for several decades before the 1920s. During the 1920s, that trend increased as birth control um, information became actually widely available. So the 1920s is actually a very, very progressive era. Um, it's not considered the progressive era, but it's progressive in so many different ways. Um, birth control clinics opened and the American Birth Control League was founded in 1921. Margaret Sanger and other founders of the Birth Control League is over here in 1921. So the modern family emerges. As the 1920s unfolded, many features of the modern family emerge. Marriage was based on romantic love. Women managed the household and finances, and children were not considered laborers or wage earners, but rather they were developing children who needed nurturing and education. So this is the beginning of education being provided to all people. Um, this is something that, that I benefited from, um, that you've benefited from. Um, so thanks to the 1920s, uh, children are not viewed as people that should be working in factories, but instead should be at home learning, reading, writing, um, and playing outside and being kids. So education and popular culture. During the 1920s, developments in education had a powerful impact on the country. Um, enrollment in high schools quadrupled between 1914 and 1926. Public schools met the challenge of educating millions of immigrants. Okay, so this is important for multiple reasons. First of all, this quadrupled enrollment actually changes in the 1930s because of the Great Depression. Um, but nonetheless, this is the emergent of what public school can do for people. Um, and this is kind of cool because we reap this, these benefits today. Um, I was educated in a public school. I'm sure all of you are in a public school right now with TSATs. Um, but there's nothing wrong with private schools. I'm just saying that this idea that a public institution is there for all of us to learn, to grow, um, and to be nurtured is, is, is quite a phenomenon. So expanding news coverage, as literacy increased, newspaper circulation rose and mass circulation magazines flourished. So time, um, Reader's Digest, just newspapers in general. And by the end of the 1920s, 10 American magazines, including Reader's Digest and Time, boasted circulations of over 2 million. So if you remember correctly, we talked a little bit about literacy rates in the, er in the late 1800s. Newspapers were were the, the main gathering of news. Obviously, there's not the radio yet, but we're about to talk about the radio. Um, so if you couldn't read, you didn't get any news. It was all secondhand. But now that people are going to school and they're learning how to read at a young age, they're able to read newspapers and to gather news. So radio comes of age. <laughs> um, although print media was popular, radio was the most powerful communications medium to emerge in the 1920s. News was delivered faster and to a larger audience. Americans could hear the voice of the president or listen to the World Series live. So this begins the sports announcement. So when, when you're watching the NFL or you're watching the NBA um, or, the, or the World Series baseball and you hear the announcer talk about the sports, people used to gather around the radio and listen to those announcers talk about sports. 
Um, the radio becomes what we call now the modern day Netflix or TV, okay? So American heroes of the 1920s. 1929, Americans spent $4.5 billion on entertainment. This includes sports. People crowded into baseball games to see their heroes. Babe Ruth is a larger than life American hero who played for the Yankees. He hit 60 home runs in 1927. Baby Ruth. Um, then we have Lindenberg. So America's most beloved hero of the time wasn't an athlete, but a small town pilot named Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh made the first nonstop solo transatlantic flight in world history. He took off from New York City in the spirit of St. Louis and arrived in Paris 33 hours later to a hero's welcome. So when you get on a flight and you fly to Europe, thank Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> Um, so entertainment and the arts, even before sound movies offered a means of escape through romance and comedy, the first sound movies, Jazz, jazz Singer in 1927 um, came out, and the first animated with sound, Steamboat Willie, came out in 1928. By 1930, millions of Americans went to the movies each week, and this is Walt Disney's animated Steamboat Willie marked the debut of Mickey Mouse. It was seven minute long, black and white cartoon. Music and art. Famed composer George Gerwishwin um, emerged traditional elements with American jazz, and painters like Edward Hopper depicted the loneliness of American life. George O'Keefe captured um, the grandeur of New York using intensely colored canvases. This famous painting down here at the bottom is Hopper's infamous Nighthawks. The writers of the 20s. The 1920s is one of the greatest literary eras in American history. Sinclair Lewis, the first American to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, wrote the novel Babbitt. In Babbitt, the main character ridicules American conformity and materialism. Writer F. Scott Fitzgerald coined the phrase jazz age to describe the 1920s. Fitzgerald wrote The Paradise Lost and The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby reflected the emptiness of New York elite society. Also has a wonderful movie, um, with Leonardo DiCaprio, if you haven't watched it. Um, Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence traumatized the clash between traditional and modern values. Willa Cather celebrated the simple, dignified lives of immigrant farmers in Nebraska and My Antonia, which is an amazing book. If you haven't read it, I love it. Ernest Hemingway, wounded in World War I, became one of the best known authors of the era. In his novels, The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, he criticized the glorification of war. His simple, straightforward style of writing set the literary standard for decades to come. Some writers, such as Hemingway and John Dos Passos, were so soured by the American culture that they chose to settle in Europe. And in Paris, they formed a group that, the, that one writer called the Lost Generation of American Writers. So the Harlem Renaissance, between 1910 and 1920, the Great Migration saw hundreds of thousands of African Americans move north to big cities from the south. By 1920, over 5 million of the nation's 12 million blacks, over 40%, lived in cities. The African American Goals. So founded in 1909, the NAACP urged African Americans to protest radical racial violence. W.E.B. -E du Bois, a founding member, led a march of 10,000 blacks uh, black men in New York to protest violence. Marcus Gavi believed that African Americans should build a separate society. And in 1914, um, Garvey founded the, uni the Universal Negro Impro uh, Improvement Association. And Gavi claimed a million members by the mid 1920s. He left a powerful legacy of black pride, economic independence, and pan Africanism. So Harlem. Harlem, New York became the largest black urban community in the country. Harlem suffered from overcrowding, unemployment, and poverty. But however, in the 1920s, it became home to a liter literary and artistic revival known as the Harlem Renaissance, or the raison -Saint. So here's an artist's depiction of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, African-American writers. The Harlem Renaissance was a primarily a literary movement led by well-educated blacks with a new sense of pride in African-American experience in America. Claude McKay's poems expressed the pain of life in the ghetto. And Missouri-born Langston Hughes was the movement's best-known poet. Many of his poems described the difficult lives of working-class blacks. Some of his poems were put to music, especially jazz and blues. 
Zora Neale Hurston wrote novels, short stories, and poems. She often wrote about the lives of poor, uns unschooled Southern black people, and she focused on the culture of the people, people, their folk ways and their values. Now we have some African-American performers. During the 1920s, black performers won large followings. Paul Rubison, son of a slave, became a major dramatic actor. His performance in Othello, Othello sorry, was widely praised. Louis Armstrong, jazz was born in the early 20th century as well. In 1922, a young trumpet played player named Louis Armstrong joined the Creole Jazz Band. Later, he joined Fletcher Henderson's band in New York City, and Armstrong is considered the most important and influential musician in the history of modern jazz. Uh, Edward Kennedy um, Ellington, or they call him the Duke, um, in the 1920s, Duke Ellington, a jazz pianist and composer, led his 10-piece orchestra in the famous Cotton Club. Ellington won, rena was, won renown as one of the one of, sorry, as one of America's greatest composers of all time. Bessie Smith, blues singer, was, per, was perhaps the most outstanding vocalist of the decade. She achieved enormous popularity, and by 1927, she became the highest played black artist in the world. And that's it, guys. So that is the Roaring Twenties and the Harlem Renaissance. Um, this is the final lecture of the first half of world, uh, sorry, world, of U.S. history. Um, Starting in the second trimester, we will start off with the Great Depression. Till next time, have a good day.